so is it visible yes yes sir you can okay. go ahead okay so i'll be sharing with you some of the tips and tricks about this common supracondylar humerus fracture which we all are dealing and probably after my talk those who are not doing it can do it very well so so you know it's a most common elbow fracture about 60% almost 60% of the uh, cases of uh, you see in the uh, supracondylar humerus fracture and almost one fifth of all pediatric fractures the peaks around the 7 years of age because of the remodeling and in one of the studies by chang it has been shown that elbow hyperextension is seen in these children which is greater than in a comparable non injured children and we all know that majority are extension type the vast majority of children get this fracture falling fall from outstretched hand which is called fouche through the thinnest portion of the distal humerus now this will be the overview of my talk the classification assessment some operative steps the tips and the cases which we will do after these talks are over now we all know this classical gartland classification which was published in a of journal in 1959 which is dependent on the lateral x ray and based on the anterior humeral line the type 1 is non displaced type 2 is moderately displaced with intact cortical hinge and type 3 severely displaced now this over simplistic classification has been classified has been modified by wilkins as type of injuries type 1 injuries are similar to what classified what was classified by gartland as non displaced or minimally displaced less than 2 mm and ahl that is anterior humeral line crosses the capital nerve remember it does not necessarily bisect as once once thought it crosses the capital nerve with a normal bowman's angle now type 2 injuries are displaced with a hinge posterior cortex and this has been further sub classified as type 2a with no rotational or angular abnormality just like a just only posterior translation and type 2b with rotational and angular deformity resulting in more instability and deformity if managed conservatively in fact some of the, some of the authors have classified this as type 3 now type 3 we are all clear are completely displaced with no cortical contact however they can be further sub classified as type 3a in which you can see the fracture has displaced postero medially the distal fragment with intact postero medial hinge and the type 3b with lateral periosteal hinge is intact because of the postero lateral displacement now what you can see in a postero medial postero medial displacement the radial nerve is at rest and in a postero lateral displacement it is neurovascular bundle which is at stretch or at rest now to this we have special types which is type 4 which was added later by lich it's a multi directional instability with no periosteal hinge what happens can you see in this photograph that fracture flips from extension to flexion type this could be due to initial injury which could be severe or iatrogenically and a resident trying to forcibly reduce this fracture and which you usually see in a closed uh, while you are doing the closed reduction in a operating room now another pitfall a common mistake is to under appreciate a fracture with which is which has a medial combination now most of the i will say the beginners would not recognize this and because you see on a lateral view it appears reasonably there is a good alignment but when you see clearly there is a loss of bowman's angle and these fractures usually unite with varus malunion hence be aware of this uh, fracture which looks like a type 1 though actually it's considered as a type 2 with a medial combination now most of us usually our younger residents fail to document the motor sensory and vascular examination which i think they find it very difficult in a younger child but remember the two simple signs getting the young child to do thumbs up will definitely help you to test the radial nerve by extension of the wrist and thumb and medial nerve can be tested by flexion of the second and third digits and a learner by doing the okay sign where abduction of the digits would reliably give the function of the ulna nerve as well as the anterior interosseous nerve by flexion of index and the thumb dip now sensory examination again might be difficult but remember the discrete area of the autonomous zone where the radial nerve is dorsal web space the medial nerve is the palmar surface of the index finger and the ulna nerve on the ulna side of the little digits so not only you should check but you should also document why this is important at times you see the deficit which uh, you recognize it later and the parents might blame this on the surgical intervention which might be their pre op okay. now 
vascular examination is an essential part of a supracondylar fracture because 20 percent of the fractures are associated with some kind of vascular compromise it is not only the palpable radial pulse but you should check the capillary refill which should be less than three to five seconds the color of the palm and the fingertips the warmth which is more of subjective sensation but it does help you to check the vascular status and the turgor the turgor of this finger pulp now based on this vascular status you classify the uh, fracture or into three types the hand is well perfused there's no problem warm red and radial pulse is present the hand remains well perfused but the radial pulse is absent which i would add a pink pulse pulseless as well as puzzling hand which still there are some controversies and the last the hand is poorly perfused it is cool or cold blue or blanch with radial pulse absent which is also called pale pulseless hand so we'll be just doing main part of our hand which is well perfused okay now don't forget to examine the compartment because you might miss a developing compartment syndrome which might put you in a problem so remember some of the fractures in which compartment pressure can increase like in a which fracture with a considerable swelling with a tense volar compartment floating elbow associated forearm fracture cubital ecchymosis like in this child anterior skin puckering which is also called a pucker sign and an absent pearl along with a passive extension pain with passive extension and flexion remember friends the child you don't find the five p's you have to look for three a's the anxiety agitation and increasing need for analgesia which are very good useful signs for developing compartment syndrome especially in a child now coming to the management part briefly but type 1 supracondylar fracture which at times you even don't see clearly the only radiographic sign would be a fat pad sign okay? and there will be localized tenderness but having said this the prognosis is definitely good ahl bisects the capitulum on the lateral view the bowman's angle is more than 10 degree that is normal in ap view so what do you do you give a cast immobilization in 90 degree of flexion for about three weeks but friends they have to be monitored radiographically and beware you don't miss a fracture like this with a medial combination which can go into varus collapse okay. now type 2 the optimal management is still debatable but the emerging cons uh, consensus these days is that almost all of the type 2 fractures are fixed now type 2a which i told you earlier extension type with no rotation with normal bowman's angle close reduction and casting with good molding and avoiding hyperflexion like this can give you a good result but one of the paper has shown that to truly stabilize these fractures you need to hyperflex this elbow and hyperflexing the elbow has been <coughs> shown to sorry shown to a flexion beyond 110 degree has shown to be seen that pulse is lost on doppler so there is a dilemma you truly want to stabilize but you have to hyperflex and moreover number of papers have shown one of the paper by parik that when he reviewed 25 cases of type 2 supraglenoid fracture which were managed by close reduction and casting 28 percent had loss of reduction and 20 percent required delayed surgery so the emerging consensus remains that these fractures should also be fixed provided you have all the good conditions however there is no debate about this type 2b which at times may be difficult to recognize but you can see clearly that along with the translation there is a rotation as well as angulation and close reduction and percutaneous spinning remains the preferred mode of treatment and if not and if not done you can have outcome like this this young girl actually was managed conservatively outside and she presented with a cubitus whereas deformity in this type of fracture not type 3 type 3 now we are all actually we know the management of this type 3 the standard of care remains the operative reduction and close spinning in majority of the cases because of this significant rotational malalignment soft tissue injury and combination but you might ask and unfortunately some of these fractures are still managed conservatively why not close reduction and casting but has been shown repeatedly that flexion beyond 70 degrees this loss of pulse on doppler which might predispose these fractures to compartment syndrome if you are trying to manage them conservatively and moreover now it is clear that type 3 fracture are more likely to lose reduction and return to surgery if we try to manage them conservatively now before how do you actually do the close spinning i'll show you a few tips and tricks 
Now make sure that if preoperatively check that you have a the OR table with a short radial radio lucent arm board. Remember, so that at times you have to place the child head even on the arm board so that you can better image the elbow. Now this avoid CM receiver as a tabletop, which was actually popular earlier because at times in an unstable adduction, you might have to rotate the CM instead of rotating the elbow. So fluoro should be parallel to the table okay? and monitor should be opposite to the surgeon. And this is my request that do the imaging before you start reducing and giving the traction because at times you don't get the good films because of the uh, pain and the other factors. So a first step is reduction traction with elbow flex to 20 to 30 degree remember it has to be sustained traction with a counter traction against the axilla first step is align in ap view don't jump into sagittal view align in ap view with a varus or valgus pressure in a c arm checking in a c arm can you see in this that by giving a valgus pressure the fracture is aligned now then you it comes that you flex the elbow giving a pressure anterior pressure over the olecon and you have to gently pronate in a posteromedial type of fracture okay? because the intact periosteum is posteromedial, which makes it tense, okay? which helps in reduction. Now, when you see a reduction like this, the uh, you can still see that the anterior humeral line is still touching the anterior aspect. It is not crossing the capitulum. It shows that still there is an extension deformity and still unreduced. So you make sure that deformity is completely reduced by checking the anterior humeral line. And one of the tips is when it is completely reduced, the child's elbow should flex enough so that fingers touch the shoulder, ipsilateral shoulder, and there's a bone to bone feeling. Don't forget to check the oblique views, which are also called the columnar views, columnar views, medial oblique, lateral oblique. So before you start pinning, make sure that your all the four parameters are in place. The Bowman's angle is well above 10 degree. The AHL intersects the capitulum and there's an intact medial and the lateral columns. Now, once this is done, you maintain the reduction by taping the elbow in a hyperflex position. Now, you might be asking why taping? So, it makes your life easy and even you don't need an ex assistant. So, you just uh, tape it, you just trial any kind of tape and keep a folded towel under the elbow. Now, one of the tips is don't jump into drilling first. Imagine lateral condyle like a pin cushion. Use a free pin, not a pin loaded on a drill, and think little condyle like it because they're cartilaginous. Think like a pin cushion and hold the wire against the distal little condyle and check the trajectory so because you can check the trajectory whether it will be going right in AP as well as in the lateral view. So you don't make multiple entry points. And, and in case of unstable fractures, you might have to even rotate the C arm. So once you sh you're sure that trajectory is okay you start dealing, advance with a drill, and make sure that you engage both the proximal and the distal cortex in AP, lateral, as well as medial and lateral oblique views. And check more pins. And once you have added two pins, you can further extend the elbow to see the coronal alignment and pass another pin. Now, so again, you see there should be good pin spread and as well as the pins should not cross each other. I'll come to that. So what do you avoid while pinning? The for, first and foremost, inadequate number of pins and thinner pins. Like a fracture like this, a type three, which was managed by using thinner pins and which were also not adequate, the fracture was not adequately reduced. And the outcome was like this, which is quite bad. So general recommendation is two pins for type two and three pins for type three. Even you can add one more pins, either medial or lateral if possible, in case you find some instability. Now, failure to achieve bicortical fixation as well as poor spin, uh, pin spread is an important factor for LOR. LOR is loss of reduction. So according to Pennock, he has outlined that pin should be either parallel or divergent and pin spacing should be at least one third the width of the humerus at the level of the fracture. If possible, it should be wide pin spacing. And I'll show you how you can do this. You can engage both the proximal and distal segment you start your first pin, which should cross medial to the olecon fossa. A second pin, which should be later to the fossa. And a third pin, which should pass through the fossa so that you have a bike, you have better purchase, you have more cortical purchase while passing through the olecon fossa. In a lateral view, remember, when it is reduced, the capitulum is slightly anterior to the plane of fracture. So pin should angulate slightly 10 to 15 degree posteriorly, the first pin. And the second pin may be parallel to the humeral shaft. 
Now, how to avoid pin conversions and pin crossing? Now, one of the tips is, remember friends, when you cross outside, the pins will diverge inside. So always make sure that you have a crossing outside and the pins will diverge inside the fracture. Now, a big question is where to use the medial pin? At times, a fracture like this, a medial oblique fracture, when lateral pins are not adequate, do not provide adequate stability, and even difficult to pass the third pin, you can pass a medial pin, but only when you have done the lateral pinning and you can extend the elbow so that nerve goes posteriorly. I prefer to use a small incision that's called mini open and preferably a drill guide to protect the ulna nerve. Okay. And stability wise, it has been shown that lateral entry pins are equivalent to the cross pin in terms of torsional stability. Okay. Now, before you close, assess the stability of reduction. Stress the reduction in varus valgus flexion extension. Do the final coronal alignment in maximum extension and don't leave the operation, operating theater without checking the pulse. Now, give a snugly fit cast. And remember, not in 90 degree or hyperflexion, but about 60 to 70 degree. It is not the cast which is holding the fracture. It is the pins which you have put it perfectly and bivalve the cast. Now, these are some of the tricks to aid close reduction, uh, like Herzog described a diaphyseal chance pin to manipulate the proximal fragment. Though I haven't used this, this liver technique by Pi and this silver has described a intrafocal pin in a distal fragment. I'll show you in a, in a, in a case that you can use this in a type four or in a flexion deformity, a flexion type of fracture. A late presenting fracture with blisters and swelling again is a problem. And at times we have no other solution except to put these children on traction. The outcome is not excellent, but definitely these fractures heal well and have reasonable good alignment. Now, briefly, just last few slides on open reduction. And the commonest indication remains the irreducible fracture, especially the interposition of brachialis or neurovascular structure. And the second common indication remains the poorly perfused hand, which requires vascular exploration. Now, coming to the open reduction, the anterior approach is commonly used. But remember, friends, you might think you might be thinking that open reduction is easier. But remember, it's a deceptively deceptively simple and because of the extensive extensive periosteal stripping the fractures are quite unstable there's a sharp metaphyseal spike which can display the neurovascular structures so you must remember the neurovascular anatomy of the cubital fossa incision could be transverse or a lazy s i prefer a transverse incision but make sure that incision is over the edge of the fracture and avoid dissecting through this traumatized skin stay later to the biceps if you are doing for irreducible fracture, but you have to uh, you have to go medial to the biceps in case you want to explore the neurovascular bundle. There's one reduction technique where surgeon can use a manual thumb pressure over the proximal fragment, and the other hand using a uh, bone lever or Hohmann elevator, where assistant hyperflexes the elbow and pin the usual way. But I prefer this technique. If you are doing the open reduction, you can uh, you can use two retrograde two uh, K wires. Uh, uh, inserted into the distal fragment, which can be used like a joystick. And once the fracture is reduced, you uh, cross the, uh, do the pinning in a cross pin fashion. So this is the usual mode, which I prefer. Posterior approach is done by some of our residents, but uh, I tell, tell them to avoid this approach because you are dissecting through the virgin area, increases the post of stiffness. And in fact, you are disrupting the blood supply of the trochlea, which might go into osteonecrosis. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.